evening and welcome to our fourth and final panel in a series of interdisciplinary uh, panels on the face of modern capitalism. My name is Alvina. Um, today, the focus of our discussion will be centered around the rise of geopolitical, social, and economic borders of the West. Before we proceed any further, I would like to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the ancestral, traditional, unceded, and occupied indigenous territories of the Coast Salish peoples, in particular the Muscan Nation. The Muscan territory on which BC Point Great Campus is located was never surrendered, relinquished, or, nor handed over by the Muscan people to Canada or British Columbia. Therefore, the land is sovereign and unsurrendered. We'd like to thank the Muscan Nation for allowing us to hold this event today. I would also like to thank Dr. David Silver for his continuous support and guidance in the organizing of this roundtable series. For those of us who are not able to be here today, the event is being audio and video recorded. I would like to ask your consent to record the discussion. Please raise your hand if you have any issues with the recording. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so the discussion will be uploaded on YouTube and posted sometime next week. Now I would like to introduce you to our facilitator for today, Tanya Tomzada, who will introduce the panelists and then guide us through the discussion. Tanya is currently completing her degree in gender, race, sexuality, and social justice. She holds positions as the chair at the UBC Social Justice Center and the Toulon. She's currently interested in how decolonial methodologies are engaged within resistant practices of diasporic, racialized migrant and refugee communities. Tanya aligns her politics within the framework of acknowledging ongoing Southern colonialism, the complexity of intersectionality, and the use of Negro politics as state-sanctioned violence. All right, thank you so much, Albina. Um, pleasure to meet all of you and also the panelists. Uh, just quickly before I go on, I'd also I'd like to acknowledge my existence and my words on the stolen um, ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people. So I'm going to start off by uh, introing everyone here. So first off, we have uh, Lisa, who has worked as an assistant professor of the Hispanic Studies at UBC and is currently teaching as a sessional instructor at the Institute for Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice. She's a social justice activist and educator. She teaches film and popular culture with a special <coughs> emphasis on resistance and decolonizing movements. Both her teaching interests and activist work focuses on indigenous justice and black liberation movements, Muslim women's movements, anti-capitalist struggles, migrant struggles, post-civilization and environmental justice, grassroots activism, and animal rights feminism. Welcome. Next up is Daniel Sagai. Uh, who is a Vancouver-based community organizer with a focus on issues of anti-blackness, racism, class struggles, and migration. He's a writer for Rank and File, a Canadian labor news site, and does union communications. In the past, his work was featured in the Georgia Strait, Toronto, Star, and Rabble, among others. Currently, Daniel is at the early stages of campaigning under the banner of We Welcome African Refugees. He is Eritrean, uh, noting the right to narrow Eritrea is experiencing a devastating refugee crisis with more people leaving the country per capita than Syria. Welcome. All right. After that is Dr. Jamie Peck, who is Canada Research Chair in Urban and Regional Political Economy and Professor of Geography at UBC. <coughs> he is an institutional political economist working on a range of issues relating to economic geography, urban restructuring, labor regulation, and statecraft. Such of Dr. Peck's research is concerned with the ways in which primarily global processes, for example, forms of market-oriented governance are remade through local sites, distanced networks, and grounded practices. He is currently working on the restructuring of contingent employment regimes and the dynamics of fast policy and the fiscal transformation of the local state. Welcome. <clears throat> Next up is Dr. Vanessa Andrachi, um, who is an associate professor at the Faculty of Education and is the Canada Research Chair in Race, Inequality, and Global Change. Her research examines historical and systemic patterns of reproduction of inequalities and how these limits or enables possibilities for collective existence and global change. 
Vanessa Publications is in a field that includes analysis of political economies, of knowledge production, discussions of the ethics of international development, and the critical comparisons of ideals of globalism and internalization in education and in global activism with an emphasis on representation of and relationships with marginalized communities. Welcome to you as well. Dr. Greg Mann is professor of geography at SFU. His principal teaching and research interests concern the political economy of capitalism. Currently, his research has two general themes. The first is the historical development and future tra trajectory of macroeconomic governance in the affluent global north. Dr. Mann is particularly interested in the ways that the state attempts to address political, economic, and ecological crisis, both in the policies it develops, the ideas, and politics that shape these policies, and the historical and political economic conditions that make these ideas make sense. His second research interest lies in exploring the challenges global climate change possesses to the contemporary geopolitical order. Welcome. Next is Dr. Nora Angels, is Associate Professor at the School of Community and Regional Planning and the Institute of Gender, Race, Sexuality, and Social Justice at UBC. She is also Faculty Research Associate at UBC Center for Human Settlement, where she has been involved in a number of applied research and capacity building research projects in Brazil, Vietnam, Southeast Asian countries as well. Her continuing research and interests are on community and international development studies and social policy, participatory planning, governance, participatory action research, and the politics of transnational feminist networks, women's movements, and the agrarian issues, particularly in the Southeast Asian region. Welcome you as well. Last but not least, we have Zahra Nakvi, who is a writer, poet, editor, and community organizer living on unceded Coast Salish lands. She is pursuing a BA in English Honors and Creative Writing at UBC. She is currently co-facilitating a student-directed seminar on borders and social and migratory movements on the 21st century, through which she and her peers are exploring the ways in which both physical and conceptual borders are currently changing and intersecting with global and political movements. Zahra's research and creative interests lie in interrogating issues on race, migration, displacement, Islamophobia, and representations of Muslims in the media. So big welcome to all of you. Extreme pleasure to have you here. All right, so our first section is named Economic Globalization and Neoliberalism. Does anyone have a comment on this? So it's basically uh, signaling towards globalization, how it intersects with neoliberalism, who wins, who loses, and how it feeds into the current climate of Trump and uh, violence surrounding that. Anyone want to get started? Okay. Maybe Jeff, Jamie? Yeah, I think uh, Jeff, and, uh, Jeff and I are... I've got the, uh, the remit to speak about the boring economic uh, part of the uh, conversation before we get into the uh, more interesting parts. Um, uh, so let me just uh, respond to a couple of the questions that uh, Albina uh, set us uh, earlier uh, about what is neoliberal globalization uh, and what, if anything, does it have to do uh, with uh, the Trump uh, moment and the Brexit uh, vote. Um, so perhaps if I do some of the uh, definitional plodding stuff, uh, Jeff can also run with that. So first of all, uh, what do we mean by this uh, word neoliberalism? I take it to be a, uh, a term that refers to an ascendant uh, pattern of politics, state transformation, and ideological alignment, uh, which has become increasingly prevalent since the 1970s, and I would argue uh, now hegemonic, but never in a kind of singular or uncontested way. What neoliberalism indexes, and it's largely a critic's term, I should uh, emphasize, what it indexes is a unstable marriage between strong states and free markets. Uh, and in fact, a variety of unstable marriages between strong states and free markets, which exist in multiple 
configurations have been always evolving uh, and have complex uh, geographies. Uh, some of the recurrent indicators uh, of neoliberalism uh, so that allow us to uh, know it when we see it, if you like, are an orientation to uh, small state and low tax systems, especially in economic and social policy, an orientation to individualism, uh, to uh, choice and to the positive roles of competition, a preference for private over public uh, provision, accommodation of corporations, including the tolerance for private uh, monopolies, an orientation to policy strategies like privatization, liberalized finance, free trade, light touch regulation, and devolved programming, all of which are unevenly and somewhat inconsistently applied, but which can be seen uh, over and over in a recurrent and patterned way. And finally, and not least, because this is one of the major animated animating forces of neoliberalism, deep antipathies to labor unions, to progressive redistribution, to socially progressive movements more generally, to social welfare, and to bureaucratic systems. So uh, neoliberalism knows what it's broadly for, but it absolutely knows what it's against, uh, which are uh, those things I just uh, listed. Sometimes neoliberalism is known as the Washington Consensus, but it's always been uh, more complex and diffuse than that. It exists in a multipolar way, reproduced uh, around the world through multiple centers simultaneously. So we can only understand neoliberalism then as a complex, multi-centered phenomenon. It's not some singular, static uh, phenomenon. Post-2008, after the Wall Street crash, we might think of uh, as entering a period of late neoliberalism, uh, where neoliberal strategies of rule occupy a wasteland of their own making, uh, having defeated many of their uh, counter-hegemonic alternatives, uh, co-opted others. Uh, neoliberalism now exists in a way which uh, Neil Smith, the geographer, once described as dead but dominant. Uh, in many respects, it's lost some of its animating force, yet it still dominates the political uh, scene. Uh, some of the outcomes uh, that Albina asked us to mention, I would say, include uh, the fact that neoliberalism tends to act upon, produce, and accentuate inequalities, fosters insecurity, especially at the bottom of the social uh, uh, system. It, uh, it, impo it imposes market rationalities and market uh, uh, rationalizations that legitimate uh, unequal outcomes, while they offer little uh, or no basis for resolving uh, social and economic inequalities. So neoliberalism legitimates uh, upward redistribution to the wealthy. Uh, it erodes social insurance, social transfer systems, and indeed uh, social bonds. And it erodes systems of pro progressive taxation and some, but not all, uh, state capacities. So if that's what neoliberalism is, what's it doing? Uh, what's, what's the relationship between that and Trump and Brexit? I would say uh, that there are complex connections between neoliberalization uh, and Trump and Brexit. I would identify three systemic uh, drivers. Uh, one is class dislocations, which in a sense provide a precondition uh, for both Trump's politics and for Brexit. The second I'll call conservative revolutions, uh, which refers to changes within the orientation of governing conservative parties. And thirdly, I'll call that, that liberal accommodations, which is about the transformation of the politics of the centre-left. So I'll say a little bit about each of those and then hand over to Jeff to uh, give you the various punchlines, I hope. So, um, first of all, class dislocations. Uh, in some respects, I'd argue this provides some of the preconditions for the, pro for the rise of Trump and the Brexit vote. I would be rather more cautious about suggesting uh, that class dislocations are the driving force uh, for, uh, for these recent politics. But I'm referring to class dislocations in the sense of those that lost out uh, under uh, the recent waves of neoliberalization, especially in the deindustrialized uh, regions of the UK and the United States. Now, the iconic white working class Trump voter uh, might be considered to live in some of those regions. Uh, but I'd, I want to be a bit cautious about that interpretation 
Uh, because if we look closely at the, the election outcome in the United States, uh, more or less 70,000 people located in a few swing states like uh, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania uh, uh, helped put Trump over the top. Most of his vote came from the conservative vote coming home to him. He got more or less the same vote as Mitt Romney, uh, and he got them by catering to their uh, interest, especially control over the Supreme Court and, and so on. So, um, uh, yes, that kind of white working class element was important, perhaps to put o Trump over the top in the Electoral College, but we're speaking of tens of thousands of people in a, an election which counted millions, uh, and much of Trump, what Trump did was get the conservative vote uh, to come to heel just before the election. Uh, second class dislocation in the United Kingdom, uh, I think in the UK Brexit vote, a mixture of class, generation and geography uh, largely account for the pattern of the Brexit vote. Uh, again, it was those left behind uh, from the pattern of cosmopolitan growth centered on London and the South East especially, uh, but also the other cities in the UK. Um, uh, that was, is where much of the Brexit vote uh, came from. It's from, from outside of those urban areas, especially uh, some of those that had suffered in the past 30 years. Uh, I'm going to accelerate quickly now on the, through the next two. Conservative revolutions are, think, are much more actively behind both the Brexit vote uh, and the uh, Trump phenomena. Uh, by conservative re revolutions, I mean intra-party transformations, the changes in conservative parties themselves. So since Reagan, uh, the US Republican Party has become increasingly radical pursuing an agenda of rolling tax cuts, deregulation, uh, mixed with a pretty poisonous form of uh, cultural politics centered on guns, abortion, and dog whistle politics around race. Uh, since 2010 in particular, and the rise of the Tea Party and dark money financing, <coughs> the Pope Brothers and, and other phenomena that you will know about, I'm sure, uh, facilitated by media segmentation, conservative radio, uh, the rise of Fox News, um, that uh, whole process has fermented a new form of grassroots uh, radicalism on the right, um, which essentially rails also against the uh, party's own leadership. So the Republican Party has been destroying its own leadership. It's been in incapable of generating uh, sustained... Uh, uh, it, it, the, the, the candidates it runs for a presidential office are uh, invariably attacked by, their own, by its own base. And so this kind of restive grassroots politics on the conservative side helps explain why Romney got that nom oh, sorry, why Trump got that nomination. Uh, and much of what Trump is enacting uh, can be read as an authoritarian retread of neoliberal rule. Tax cuts, deregulation and so on. It's a very familiar package um, wrapped around uh, the kind of governing through chaos method that uh, seems to be uh, operating at the moment in the in the White House. But as one of the commentators on the, on the right has recently remarked, Grover Norquist of Americans for Tax Reform, the, quote, the press and a lot of observers in Washington DC like to stop and look at a car accident and they miss that the traffic is continuing to drive past at 50 miles an hour. Things are moving forward, largely on track. Now, I think that's an exaggeration when it comes to Washington politics. It's not an exaggeration when it comes to state politics where Republican control, control is high, at a higher level than any time since the 1920s. And there are a lot of veto-proof uh, Republican states now, which are enacting pretty radical uh, reforms against unions and, uh, and so on. There's a somewhat different story to be told in the UK, based on the Conservative Party's long-established anti-Europeanism uh, since Thatcher, uh, which has been royal in the Conservative Party uh, for decades. Um, coupled with the rise of UKIP and the challenge on the right, which caused the Conservatives to cater uh, to that uh, anti-immigrant uh, element of the vote. So the Brexit referendum itself was a failed party management strategy of David Cameron. Uh, it, it, the reason there was a referendum was because of the dysfunction inside the Conservative Party. It was a reckless gamble which blew up in his face and cost him the premiership. So, much of that vote we can put down to the miscalculations of a dysfunctional Conservative Party, and I think we can make a similar point uh, about um, 
<coughs> the Republicans in the United States. Last point is about liberal accommodations. Uh, we can see the Brexit vote and um, the, uh, uh, the Trump phenomena, I think, in terms of the failure of centre-left politics, or what Nancy Fraser has called progressive neoliberalism. On both sides of the Atlantic, we can tell a story of the rise and fall of third-way politics uh, in the Clinton-Blair mould. Uh, and so in, in an important sense, Hillary Clinton lost that election uh, more than Trump won, winning that election. It was about an, an exhaustion of that centre-left accommodation with neoliberal politics, which embraces economic globalisation and matches it to a social reform agenda. I'll stop there and hand to Jeff for the next part. Okay. Hi, everyone. Wait, do we clap now? <laughs> no, we're just... uh, okay, well, thank you very much for coming, coming, and thank you very much for inviting me, Albina, and for uh, everyone else being here, too. Uh, I won't speak for very long. Uh, it's, I can't tell if it was a bad idea or a good idea to, to, to say to Jamie, you go ahead, because he said a lot of what I might have said, um, which is probably good. Um, those of you who don't know Jamie may not know that he, his scholarship has done more to help us understand neoliberalism than any other scholar I'm aware of in any other language, not, not just English. So a lot of what he said is, is what I would say because I've read a lot of what he's written. Um, so, but I, presumably I wasn't brought here just to, to, uh, to, re to repeat that, uh, other than to tell you all to go out and read it. Um, the, the one thing I, I the, the couple things I wanted to add uh, to this to the story, I think Jamie's done uh, a better job than I ever could of laying out the sort of political, economic, and to some extent more strictly political uh, in the uh, state electoral kind of frame uh, that might help us understand how we've got where we are today. I do think though that stuff that we could add to the account, and I'm sure he would have if he felt like he'd had more time. Um, that neoliberalism, to the extent that we might try to identify it, and it is really tough to pin down, um, as Jamie said, partly because the world is constantly changing, and so if you want the world to be neoliberal, you have to be constantly changing too, to keep up with it. Um, uh, but there is also, an, an, uh, a, Jamie and I a couple of years ago both were on the supervisor, supervisory committee of a student who was really interested in this part of it, so a lot of what I'm saying here comes from uh, his thinking and work, but there is a real shift, I would say, and I'm not sure how full it is yet, but it's certainly worth paying attention to. In, in, the, in for lack of a non-fancy term, the, the sort of subjectivity that goes along with living in, under a neoliberal regime, you might say. The ways we think about ourselves. Even if we choose not to think of ourselves these ways, there, there is a, a modality you kind of have to adopt today, to some extent, to get by, right? You have to think of yourself as, to some extent, uh, a person who is or is not uh, qualified to, to carry the burden of debt. We all are, for good or ill, and mostly for ill, in a position where we need to cultivate our beings such that a bank thinks we can carry a burden of debt. If you want to own a house in Vancouver, that's your only hope in hell. So you have to act out a subjectivity that you may hate. And in fact, probably the fact that you're here is a good sign that you don't like it very much. Um, uh, but it is also the case that there is a shift in how we have to understand ourselves. And of course we can resist this and oppose it and give it the finger and all the rest of it. But that the larger frame itself is nonetheless there to think about uh, as, as something that's, that's changing how we, how we do things. And that also, I think, is, has a significant impact on how we respond to those aspects of neoliberalism that hit us in the face as, as so unjust, or as so racist, or as so incredibly uh, discriminatory to people's, uh, depending upon their gender or their gender identity. All of these things, they arise in a moment in which we are subjectively experiencing neoliberalism in a very individualized way. It's been very successful in that frame. And I think that is a, an enormous part of the struggle in understanding how we might overturn it, if that makes any sense. Um, or, 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 and that's not to say that people aren't trying, and that there's not a lot of good things happening out there. But it is to say that the project is daunting in and of itself because it often feels like we're doing it on our own even when we know we're not. Um, uh, just to add a couple more things and then I'll stop. Uh, one of the questions that Albina gave us to help us think about this stuff was to ask us if neoliberalism and globalization, she's uh, separated them, uh, had made the world more efficient or fair. Now, of course, the tempting answer to that question is no. It is not more efficient or fair. Though that's not exactly true. Um, 
it is more efficient in, the, in some frames. Not necessarily frames we care about, and not necessarily frames that we would wish were more efficient. But there is a way in which, for example, global finance is considerably more efficient than it once was. It's not more fair, but global finance was never particularly fair. That's one of the things that we need to think about, is that I, I think it's really tempting, and I, I'm, just, I'm perhaps speaking only for myself, but I am describing my own sentiments when I'm kind of uncritically screaming at the radio or whatever, uh, to think that because neoliberalism is here now and it sucks so badly, to be correct grammatically, uh, <laughs> that what we, what we once had must have been at least better, and we should go back to that. Like, a lot of people have a lot of nostalgia for a kind of Keynesian welfare state, even though Keynes himself was not all that big on the welfare state, but he's gotten sucked into it in the, in the retrospect. But I, I think that one of the things that we really need to think about very hard when we're, when we're in the critical mode that Jamie has definitely encouraged us to take about thinking, what is, you know, what is neoliberalism, and how does it matter, and why does it matter, and how is it affecting us? Is, is that a nostalgia for what we basically never were is not going to get us anywhere good, I don't think. Um, and so the, a return has to be framed as much more than just a policy, policy shift back to Keynesian uh, redistributive modes that actually never reached most people in the first place, to be honest with you, but it reached the people that mattered electorally. Um, so, so that's something to think, I think, hard about is what, what we need to do uh, other than just shift the policy. Because to be honest with you, I wouldn't say it's neoliberalism as a set of policies that gave us Trump and Brexit. Even if we compare those two things and say they're the same thing. We can see in the rise of a, or the, let's say the uncovering in some senses, of what was already there as a sort of latent, a, a pr previously latent white obviously very masculinized racism, but, but that was there before. We know that was there before. So, so the question then becomes, what kinds of politics can allow that identification and that set of identifications to become central to policy making, to central to political economy itself? And I actually would think that a whole bunch of conjectures could head to that. I mean, if we look at past fascisms, not to necessarily broad brushstroke what we've got right now is fascism, though clearly there's sort of some important resonances. But if we look at past fascisms, they didn't necessarily emerge from an earlier version of neoliberalism. Some did, some didn't. It's not straightforward at all. So I think that thinking about the, the, the ways in which people mobilize is key, but also to think about the fundamental maybe frame in which someone might be desperate enough or under informed of alternatives or hateful or whatever enough to find that attractive. And I think we would find, in general, that it's a situation in which people have come to understand their dignity as tied to an order they see as collapsing. And they are fucking desperate. And when you're desperate, those things start to make sense that didn't make sense before. And that's, I think, the way we need to think about the change we're at right now, is that it's not about ticking some policy boxes and finding in the back door that, wasn't, that we didn't know was there beforehand. The situation is more troubling than that. We need to be able to find a way in which to communicate that you can live in this world in a dignified way without desperately hanging on to a system that is fundamentally unjust. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamie and Jeff. I think that was uh, enlightening in uh, giving us a bit of a financial economic side of the argument uh, in terms of neoliberalism being forever altering and how I think that brings us to the next uh, set of discussion questions, which how is this forever altering neoliberal state connected to a constant form of border imperialism and settler colonialism? Um, does anyone have comments in regards to this? Maybe Daniel, Nora, Vanessa, Lisa, any of you? We're not following what's on the. I think you're right. Next year. Can you go first? I could go first. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you decide. I kind of, I kind of felt like. We're good actors. We follow the script. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I was actually just thinking we, we've already had two men in a row. Oh, oh! You want to break the? Yeah, let's, 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 let's let me do it then. Okay. So I'm going to be cherry picking on. 
uh, from the questions that were um, given to us. And so I want to tackle first the relationship between border imperialism and settler colonialism. From my perspective, if 17th to 19th century settler colonialism is about forcing colonized nations to dismantle their walls to ensure the mobility of colonizing occupying forces, capital and resources, border imperialism in the 21st century of white nationalism has become synonymous to building walls. Not just physical walls, but walls of the mind, particularly the us versus them walls. Walls assumed to make not just America, but more importantly, corporate America great again, and again, and again, and again. By building maquiladoras in manufacturing industries and plantation economies along US-Mexican border, or within borders of so-called growth triangles, regions, and borders. Border imperialism is not just a creation of the Trump post-truth era. Border imperialism is made possible by the triumphalism of Westphalian nation-state system following settler colonialism and the consolidation in recent times of neoliberal corporate capitalism. Any white immigrant, non-white immigrant in the United States and in Canada who is asked the question, in what ways are the sense of national identity in North America built upon settler colonization, would readily answer that question by saying that America, and by extension, Canadian national identity has always built been built upon white colonial settler identity. Non-white Americans and Canadians are always looked with suspicion. Are you really American? I thought Canadians are white. Whenever they travel or cross borders, precisely because American and Canadian nation building has been premised on dominant white, Christian, heterosexist, cis-normative nation building. Think of the face of American or Canadian international development. Whether in global education, development, aid extensions, or humanitarian assistance missions. Global Affairs Canada, for example, has recently opened a call for proposals on integrating Canadian Aboriginal youth international development precisely as a necessary corrective to this public perception. I see the current Muslim immigration Syrian refugees ban as a logical continuation of long-held colonialist people's categorization and creation of racial, ethnic, religious hierarchies meant to divide and rule Muslim peoples and other neo-colonial subjects in both the Muslim and non-Muslim world. So when the man with an orange tan issued a ban, <laughs> saying with pseudo-prophetic elan, <laughs> that, and I quote, America faces a far graver threat more than it can ever understand. Our collective nightmare has just only begun. But the collective nightmare of Muslim people has started long before the ban, long before September 11 of 2001. One might say it started with the Christian crusades, continuing until the 1970s clientelist ties of the United States with Middle Eastern petrodollar states. What are the potential consequences of Trump's America first foreign policies on the global world order? I propose that it could be a strange combination of economic political isolationism, militarism, reduction of its NATO promises, and withdrawal from America's democratization promotion throughout the world. You see, when I was a student, activist associated with nationalist socialist democratic forces in the 1980s, and I don't admit this publicly very often, I used to say, along with many other left progressives in the Philippines, that and I quote, 
America's attempt to police and spread democracy and free markets around the world is hypocritical. But when Carter Page, Trump's advisor, was revealed to say the same thing, in case you do not know who Trump Carter Page is, is Trump's advisor, New York University's business school graduate who moved to Moscow in 2004, worked for Merrill Lynch until 2007 and Russian energy giant Gazprom. When he said the same thing that I was saying in the 1980s, it is deeply disturbing, not because of its truth, but because of the purpose that he wants this truth to serve, and particularly because of the audience. So on account of this man, age 70, born to plenty, driving his country towards autocracy, Aided by sycophants blind to the devious antics, childish rants, self-serving tactics, and shameless lies of the grandiose narcissist. I say America, the exceptional, will become identical to the banana republics in his race in upheaval. And then, liberty, justice, reason, and freedom won't be pallbearers at democracies funeral. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, this, um, these two discussion points, neoliberalism, or the deepening of neoliberalism and uh, border imperialism, um, I think are intimately and I want to kind of talk about it in the context of something that's deeply personal to me. Um, I'm Eritrean, which is a uh, northeastern uh, African country just north of Ethiopia. Uh, it's a pretty small country. It's somewhere between what, five and a half uh, million people. Um, in the last maybe 10 years or so, uh, there's been a huge refugee crisis, something like 5,000 people are leaving the country every single month. It's in a country of just over 5 million people, right? So that's incredible. Uh, as our moderator said, um, that is a per capita, per capita that's more refugees than Syria is producing. Um, <clears throat> now the reason for this, the reasons for this uh, refugee crisis are, of course, like any complicated issue, um, numberless. Right? There are a lot of different reasons why this has happened. Um, we can get to the, uh, the root of it, of course, is the history of colonialism and uh, occupation. Um, but more um, present, current, and ongoing, and connected to what we're talking about, uh, or the first discussion point about neoliberalism, um, the context is a lot of people are fleeing because they are either in the middle of or about to be recruited into an indefinite military conscription program in Eritrea. Uh, the idea is that legally uh, that they can be conscripted into the military for 18 months, right? That was, that was like in the books. And that's, that's legal by international law and there are many other countries that do that. The reality is that people are conscripted indefinitely, they are poorly paid, they are tortured, and they're not even involved in the military a lot of the times. A lot of the times they're just working in various uh, state-run projects, right? They're basically slaves. Now, one of these projects, one of these state-run projects is a, uh, a mining project in the Bisha region. And that mining project is owned and run by a Vancouver-based company, Nefsen Resources, right? Nefsen Resources has been accused by a number of different organizations and, uh, you know, this is, I, I think the case is airtight, that they have used, through this subsidiary, uh, slave labor, right? Enslaved Eritrean uh, military conscripts. So the primary reason that 5,000 people are leaving the country every single month is because of this indefinite military conscription program. And a Vancouver-based company 
which is seeking profit, which fuel this city, enrich this city, is complicit in that, in that whole process. <clears throat> now, to give you a sense of that process, though, what it looks like to be an enriched refugee, as I said, 5,000 are leaving every single month, and a lot of them are stuck in various refugee camps, whether it's in Sudan or Ethiopia. Actually, today is a very important day for me personally. A cousin of mine who was in a Ethiopian refugee camp for two years, just over two years, is coming to Canada today. My parents sponsored him. He'll be staying with them. Um, he was actually supposed to come in around October or November, but uh, there was a little bit of a delay. Uh, and I mean, that, that's connected to changes in immigration policy here, which maybe we'll get into later. But a lot of uh, uh, Eritrean refugees are stuck in refugee camps, like my cousin, for two years or longer, right? They, they try to get sponsored in Canada, but the uh, caps on private sponsor sponsorship are incredibly limited, right? So very few get sponsored, very few get accepted to come here. And the very few that do get accepted are, like my cousin, held there for years. So as a result, a lot of them decide to take the journey to Europe, right? And that journey is, I mean, I'm guessing people don't think it's an easy one, but I really want to give you a sense of what that looks like. This is a journey that requires thousands of dollars to hire a smuggler. Those smugglers often hold these refugees for ransom to try to get even more money. That involves torture, sexual assault. A lot of uh, refugees take, before their trip, uh, injectable contraceptives because they know they're going to be, or it's likely that they're going to be sexually assaulted. Uh, as I said, torture, incredibly brutal acts of torture to extract resource, resources. We get, we get these phone calls asking for thousands of dollars you know, on the spot, basically. And then they get to the Mediterranean, or they get to Libya, and they're tortured again. They're put in a, in a definite detention. Uh, and then sometimes they need to put up even more money, right? So another phone call. If they do cross the sea and they get to Europe, there's another problem. And this kind of connects to, again, the issue of neoliberalism, the economic reality that we're facing. The struggle for, or the, um, there's a distinction in Europe, one that we kind of see as well in Canada, between uh, so-called legitimate refugees and economic migrants. Legitimate refugees come from war-torn countries, right? Syria, Afghanistan. Uh, economic migrants come from poverty, that's all, right? So that's Eritrea, that's other African states. The claim is that they aren't as legitimate. They, they don't require as much, they don't require sanctuary or asylum as much as other people, right? They require solidarity as much as people fleeing war torn countries. The reality, of course, is that these people know, as I said, people knowingly take uh, injectable contraceptives before their trip. They know what they're risking. They know that they may be tortured. They, may, they know that uh, just as many people are dying in the Sahara as they are in the sea. Right? You know, we, we, see, well, we see the numbers of thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean in, in a year. Well, roughly the same amount are dying just in the Sahara, getting lost in windstorms, sandstorms, right? So they know, they know all these, they know the risks they're facing, and they take them anyways. To me, that, that, that tells me that what they're leaving is incredibly serious and needs to be acknowledged and that they deserve, in that light, Solidarity, right? So <clears throat> there's this distinction between economic migrants and legitimate refugees. And the stated claim is that this is a way to reduce the number of refugees and to uh, protect refugees who deserve it, who deserve real protection and sanctuary. And that there are limited resources, so we can only bring in legitimate refugees and not economic migrants. The reality, though, is that European politicians um, know that these people are still coming in, 
right? They'll make it to Greece or to Italy, they'll cross the borders, and they will be undocumented, basically. They'll make <coughs> their way to one country or another, where, wherever they have family, whether it's in Germany or in England or wherever. And they work under the table, basically, right? They're undocumented workers. And these politicians know that, right? They know that these borders are meant to be open borders, are meant to be ports, are meant to be uh, things that are, um, you know, um, not actual ways to keep people out, right? What they want is a situation where they look like they are protecting the jobs of Europeans, right? The white working class, similar situation in the United States. They want to look like they're protecting the jobs of the white working class while also creating a situation where refugees, African refugees, can come into the, uh, the continent and work under the table as precarious, fearful, frightened workers, right? People who are not going to unionize, people who are not going to stand up for their own basic labor rights, right? So <clears throat> when I think of the, I just connect these two discussion points, neoliberalism and border imperialism, or the experiences of refugees. Um, I want to highlight those two, those two specific things. The, the role of major uh, companies like this Vancouver mining company, Nefson Resources, which is based just down, downtown, and its role in fueling a refugee crisis, and also the role of uh, corporations, of businesses, of, uh, of uh, uh, politicians who uh, have these corporations and businesses in their pockets, or vice versa, um, in allowing a refugee crisis, in allowing so many people to flow in unprotected, unsupported by basic social and political safety nets for the purposes of exploiting them even more than you normally could. I think that's it. Thank you, thank you so much, um, both of you, Tanya and Nora, for your powerful words. Um, I know personally for me, things that will stick with me are, um, one, uh, Nora's words, building walls of the mind um, and alluding to borders as imaginary and both colonial in that sense. And speaking about Trump and how black, brown, indigenous, Muslim bodies and souls uh, have always been suffering even before the ban. And then that takes me to Daniel's point of complicity within continued slavery. Woo! Right on the place. <laughs> but yeah, continued uh, and complicit within slavery through refugee making and how not just the big west but us over here in Vancouver are complicit within that process. So again, thank you so much to both of you. I think um, this continuation of violence through neoliberalism, uh, through uh, Trump, the ban, really leads me to the next series of slides focusing on uh, Islamophobia and what I also like to refer to as white supremacy. Um, so yeah, if if you want to go on that, Zahra, Lisa, can I you. just have a few points about border imperialism? Of well, course, because I think no, we're not done with it. <laughs> we'll never be done with it. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Um, I just wanna I just wanna mention a few things uh, and take people back and forth from um, Turtle Island. Uh, to Europe and from Europe back to Turtle Island and explain that border imperialism has always been true. Uh, even, for example, uh, and I'm specifically speaking about Donald Trump. Um, it has always been true before Donald Trump. And I just want to mention that, and I will give you some figures and numbers so you can understand the magnitude of the violence uh, and the dispossession uh, that this phenomenon has caused to many communities and many people around the globe. So even before Trump, uh, we had uh, Obama. And Obama has been called by immigration groups 
deporter in chief because he has deported 2.5 million people. So this is not a phenomenon that we can only attribute to Donald Trump. Uh, Donald Trump, of course, continues it in, in extreme ways with uh, the bans from the eight countries and so on and so forth. But I just wanted to point that out. Um, now, going back to uh, the idea of how uh, neoliberalism has contributed to um, the dispossession of communities and people, uh, I just want to uh, add um, some points they, made, they were made that, uh, did we know that 75% uh, of the mine companies, mining companies, are actually Canadian. And they are responsible for dispossessing so many people around the globe. 75, the, the number is staggering. Now, I want to go a little bit <coughs> to numbers that have to do with the refugee crisis in Europe and how border imperialism unfolds there, because I am personally um, connected to that part of the world and I am originally from Greece and Greece actually has been plundered by neoliberalism uh, and the uh, financial crisis but that's another story for another day. I just want to say that um, the numbers of refugees uh, that we have around the world right now is we have, okay, listen to these figures. We have 65 million people that have been displaced, and the number is rising. 40.8 million are internally displaced, and that means these are the Oxfam numbers, um, and that means that 24 people are being displaced per minute. The numbers are staggering. Um, I also want to mention how um, just in 2015, I only have the numbers for 2015, one million people crossed the Mediterranean. The beginning, the, the first months of 2016, 4,000, approximately 4,000 people perished in the waters of the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean has rightly been called a cemetery of refugees. The numbers are really staggering. There are children that they cross without parents, without guardians, there are 100,000 children that have crossed, 10,000 of them remain uh, undocumented by, by authorities in Europe. They don't know where they are. They have disappeared. <coughs> now, I also want to say this, that sometimes we don't think about this but when we think of border imperialism, border imperialism, the very first thing that it does is it criminalizes, it criminalizes people whose human right is to move, particularly when they have been dispossessed by the, uh, from their land, their communities and cities, have, their villages have been bombed, their families have been killed, so when they arrive in Europe, I don't know if, if, if you follow the news, I, sometimes I just want to close my eyes and not hear anything, but I just want to say that to me, whenever I read the news, I always go, history repeats itself, history repeats itself. Um, why am I saying this? Because there are instances, the, the, treat, the criminalization of refugees, the criminalization of refugees, not just in the U.S. and in Canada, and I will, I will come back to the U.S. and Canada in a second, but particularly in Europe, 
is astounding. Did people know that in Cardiff, Scotland, refugees have to wear wristbands to get sheltered at shelter and food? Did you know that Denmark passed a law whereby refugees have to pay for their stay in Denmark by giving to the authorities their jewelry. Did you know that Hungary just announced that they are going to warehouse refugees at the border of Serbia in shipping containers? So I don't know about you, but all of this just reminds me, internment camps, Concentration comes. The Star of David, what, what have you? So this is, um, to me, we live in extraordinary moments. Uh, Canada uh, has also been seeing uh, refugees coming, I mean, asylum seeker, seekers coming through the border of Manitoba, and a lot of them a lot of them are Somalians, and they t and, and I see a parallel in the way these people cross from the U.S. to the Canadian border. Uh, they co they cross through severe climate conditions, and a lot of them I've seen images of them having lost their fingers through frostbite. Um, and I see parallels of that with how people cross the Mediterranean uh, and they risk so many things, a lot of them die. So, and the moment, and I'm, I'm talking about Canada now, the moment that these people cross, what do we do? We criminalize them. We have detention centers. In other words, we think, we, we start talking about them as illegals, undocumented, as if somehow they've broken the law, as if somehow they are criminals instead of thinking of them as vulnerable people that they knock at our door. Canada, specifically, In the mainstream media, we keep hearing about Canada House, how, how welcoming and generous Canada is to these people. I beg to differ. Um, the, the, the liberal government, the federal government, accepted 25,000 Syrians. And all we see in the media is self-congratulatory uh, comments about how great we are in welcoming these people. I beg to differ with that. Did we know that Canada and the US, two of the well, most wealthy countries, uh, they have accepted just 5% of the global refugees while impoverished developing countries, impoverished countries such as Pakistan, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey have accepted 86% of refugees. So I don't think um, we can congratulate ourselves that we have done our share and therefore we're done. Um, so these, these were some numbers I wanted to bring forward to, to give you an understanding of the, uh, of the, uh, of the magnitude of the crisis that we live in. And I, I don't even want to 
to, you know, open, I mean, we can open the discussion also to talk about, but maybe somebody else can do that, because that's a whole other kind of worms, uh, the, the climate change refugees. And I mean, who is responsible mostly for climate change? Is Western wealthy countries and the, the, our consumptive lifestyle that has caused this and uh, it seems now Trump, uh, the Trump administration is doing everything possible that this crisis, the climate change crisis, will be exacerbated even more and they are doing everything possible so this problem won't be solved. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, so I uh, want to address Alvina's question of what are the narratives the West puts forward about Muslim nations and who benefits from them? What, which role does other Muslims play in American nation formation? And I just want to first define Islamophobia. Um, it is the unfounded hostility towards Muslim and therefore fear or dislike of all or most Muslims. And some of the things I find uh, <coughs> Uh, lacking in the discussion around Islamophobia, which uh, Lenora also points out to. Um, so there are three things I think we need to keep in mind. The historical colonialist roots of Islamophobia, the selective memory and amnesia of Western imperialist forces in their narratives of Muslims and Muslim nations. And thirdly, the love of um, um, the, 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 how the mainstream media um, presents present day representations of Muslims um, as a tool to justify imperialism and occup occupation and stokes fear. So um, we can trace back, I guess, Islamophobia as far back as also Lenora mentioned to the Crusades um, and as far back as the European colonization of the MENA region. And um, according to, so there's also the term of Orientalism, which is also brought up when, when the discussion of Islamophobia. Um, it's had, according to Edward Said, Orientalism was ultimately a political vision of reality whose structure promoted the difference between the familiar, that is the Europe, West, us, and the strange, the Orient, the East, them. When depicting the Orient, the East as a target of invasion, um, the East uh, was depicted as a target of invasion and viewed as backwards, savage, and despotic as a means to justify colonization. And Rudyard Kipling famous, famous, uh, famously wrote, um, so a poet I unfortunately had to read for my degree, <laughs> <laughs> The White Man's Burden, uh, discussed how um, it was the rational, scientific white man's burden to enlighten and civilize the superstitious, despotic East. And invading the Orient was seen as a civilizing mission to bring enlightenment, rationality, and freedom to the East. It was a tool to justify colonization and invasion, and this is something that exists to this day. Um, it is also important to view, uh, like I often find when talking about Islamophobia, people will be like, well, you know, you're, you're talking about racism, and that's not the same thing as Islamophobia. Islamophobia is about a religion, and racism is separate. But I think um, it is very much intertwined with racism, um, because brown men, Islamophobia base, is based on assumptions of looking, viewing brown men, men as dangerous, as savages, and brown women as weak and in need of uh, rescuing. Um, and also, even in, in North American context, it's important to remember that an estimated 15 to 30 percent of Africans who were kidnapped and enslaved in the United States were Muslim. So North America's problematic relation with Islam is as old as slavery. Um, so, so yeah, in other words, Islamophobia is not a, a post-9-11 phenomena, um, but has roots as far back as colonization, as the Crusades, and as slavery. Um, but bringing it to post-9-11, uh, so in 2006, George W. Bush issued the following statement, and I want to read it out so we can sort of look at the trends that have continued to this day. Since the horror of 9-11, we've learned a great deal about the enemy. 
And we have learned that their goal is to build a radical Islamic empire where women are prisoners in their homes, men are beaten for missing prayer meetings, and terrorists have a safe haven to plan and launch attacks on America and other civilized nations. The war against this enemy is more than a military conflict. It is the decisive ideological struggle of the 21st century and the calling of our generation. This struggle has been called a clash of civilizations. In truth, it is a struggle for civilization. We are fighting to maintain the way of life enjoyed by free nations. So here he, construct the, he constructs the earth, us versus them narrative. There is a clearly defined enemy that is against human rights. Which, um, so it justifies uh, American invasion and occupation. It is thus the job of the United States and so-called free nations to bomb these nations to democracy and freedom. The logic is astounding, but shockingly widespread and prevalent to this day. Which brings me to my second point, the amnesia and selective memory when talking about um, uh, war on terror and Islamophobia. In his address, and often within war on terror rhetoric, there's a tendency for selective memory. Laura Bush and Michelle Obama both have, in the, during their uh, terms, have called for women's rights in Afghanistan, but to what extent do they acknowledge their own country's role in providing billions of dollars of funding to the Mujahideen who had very extreme views about women and who later became the Taliban and banned women from attending school, working or having access to health care. The narrative is construed as an us versus them narrative and there's no mention how, how, of how the us is very much complicit in the actions of the them. But this is precisely how the politics of empire function. Trump in his 20, 2015 statement calling for the Muslim ban describes the enemy as um, eager to commit atrocities as uh, atrocities as murder against non-believers who won't convert, beheadings, and more unthink unthinkable acts that pose, pose great harm to Americans, especially women. This rhetoric is very much in line with what we have already heard um, for the past two decades. There's nothing, if anything that's new about what Trump is saying, it's just he's putting it in simpler layman's terms. Um, that's, that's much of what it is. And it also doesn't—it doesn't—it it, it doesn't uh, look at provide the context of how decades of Western intervention, imperialism, invasion, occupa occupation, billions of dollars worth of arms deals um, have done to destabilize the region and cause these human rights uh, violations. It is as if human rights atrocities taking place in Muslim countries a, only com are only committed by Muslim militants, failing to mention the U.S. Army's own history of human rights abuses and torture, and b, the role that Muslim nations have in causing uh, these atrocities in the first place. Um, and even with the refugee crisis, uh, there, there's an unwillingness to interrogate um, the, the role of the wealthy countries in causing a lot of these crises in the first place. So a lot of when a lot of these policies are put into place, or if wealthy countries are only accepting 5% of uh, refugees, uh, when in fact they are contributing, biggest contributors to the refugee crisis. And then finally, there's the issue of media representation. Uh, most representations of Muslims within film and news media are related to war, terror, and violence. The problem is not just, it's not, of course, like such violence does exist, but it's, it's the fact that the primary representations of Muslims is in that particular context. And this is, I think, a very crucial cause of Islamophobia, particularly in North America and in Europe and in Western countries. What exists in the public psyche about Muslims are images of violence and terror and oppression. Um, this also serves as empire because it only furthers the dominant Orientalist narrative about uh, Muslims and Muslim men and Muslim women. And this has violent repercussions with hate crimes against Muslims reaching an all-time high. Um, it is, allows a state of fear, allowing populations to fear uh, uh, Muslim immigrants. Headlines such as Newspaper headlines will have things like Muslim killers, Muslim rage, and just images of uh, brown men holding AK-47s declaring jihad. Uh, when this is the prominent narrative 
uh, which goes for sensational headlines and images rather than contextualizing these issues as regional pol political issues, um, this, was, this will only further bigotry, Islamophobia, fear, and allow for the war on terror and West, allow for war on terror and Western imperialism to strengthen and continue in the region because they will find support at home. Um, it, and on a personal level, like it is very terrifying I went after these kind of images are out there in the media to walk out in the public as a Muslim woman. Like I've been followed, I've been harassed. People will ask me after the Paris, Paris attacks, this, this man followed me down a block um, yelling at me, what did you think of what happened in Paris? Um, Muslim women are afraid of standing close to, at the Sky Train station, standing close to the train tracks. We have to walk, um, stand back because we might get pushed, which has happened quite often. So I think, I think these, are, these are sort of the three things that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about these issues. Um, it's, it's the historical and colonialist roots of Islamophobia, not seeing it as just, you know, as something that's just a post 9-11 phenomenon. And also the selective memory and amnesia of Western imperialist forces in their narratives about Muslims and Muslim nations, and also how the media uh, manipulates and um, represents Muslims. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa and Zahra, for your radiant, radiant words. Um, I think a persisting theme that's going on is how this violence is ongoing and persisting through things like oceans that are, serve as cemeteries and killing grounds for refugees, um, serve as Islamophobia and the history of coloniality and white supremacy. Um, and I think that leads us to one of our last discussion points, which is white nationalism. Vanessa, would you like us, would you uh, please let us enlighten us of how white supremacy and nationalism relates to all of these uh, topics? Okay. Thank you for the invitation. I think I'll start by acknowledging the land as a living entity, the Musqueam as the ancestral uh, custodians of this land, and you all as my relatives. So uh, I think I'll have to reframe it a little bit in terms of going back to the question about the, when our dignity is dependent on a collapsing system. Because I think it's not just an issue for white supremacists, it's an issue for, for everybody. And um, I will go for broad strokes and metaphors. And this is partly because I don't believe more knowledge about these issues, more descriptions can change the situation and this I can go back to that at the end I think knowledge is important this is all very important but I don't know if the expectation that it will change something uh, is realist so remind me if I forget to go back to that because I think that's important because this is being recorded <laughs> so <laughs> um, I think I will invite you to construct a metaphor with me and it's a metaphor of a house um, the foundation of the house is separability, right? So how we are separated, what we see ourselves as separated from the land, how we see ourselves as separated from each other, how we see ourselves as, as groups uh, separated uh, in a, a, a hierarchy of civilization, for example, grounded on a single story of progress, development, and human evolution. So imagine that house with that foundation. And there's a carrying wall of nation states. Right? that promise you security in borders and promise you also a kind of a fantasy of homogeneity in the national body. The other carrying wall is rational individualism. So this faith that knowledge will take us there. A specific kind of knowledge but that knowledge can engineer a world that is perfect and that can probably defeat time and death. And we can see a roof. There was a People have been playing with the roof. There have been other um, other configurations, but we, we see the roof as a, the roof of global capital, right? That um, promises you that prosperity uh, is achieved through social mobility. And now, if we look at ourselves inside this house, uh, thinking about happiness, for example, the promise of the house is that happiness happens through consumption, right? Through accumulation. So if we see ourselves in this house and we start to see the mold in the walls and some of the walls cracking, right? what are we going to do? 
If we believe in the promise of prosperity through social mobility, security through borders, and uh, happiness through consumption, you're going to feel a little bit shaken right? and feel a bit threatened, especially if there are lots of people knocking on the door uh, because we have promised these things to other places, not telling these places that the house was actually built on the broken back of other people, right? Not telling these people that this house is actually unsustainable because it doesn't consider the biophysical limits of the planet. It hides the externalized costs, human costs, and environmental costs of its production. Now it's, uh, it's growing so much, it has grown so much, that it is um, exhausting what we can exploit, what we can expropriate to be able to maintain it. Now this house is collapsing. I think there are two then possibilities here as a starting point. One, if you believe that these promises were realistic, but they are broken now, the promise of happiness, prosperity, and uh, security, if you believe these promises are broken, you're going to fight to reinstate these promises with whatever you have uh, at your disposal, right? You're not going to be thinking twice about that, be it fascism, be it whatever. If you believe these promises were unrealistic from the outset, then you have other possibilities. You are asking different questions. You are asking actually existential questions about what does it mean to exist in the planet? Do we need a house? Do we need another house? Can we live outside of the house? I think in that sense, uh, if we look at white nationalism, I think the, the, the sense that I, I get is that it's the broken promise scenario, right? We want the same securities that we perceive now to be broken. We, we need to reinstate them. Whereas very few people I see uh, talking about the fact that the house is unsustainable and has been, and has been violent for a long time. It's not something new. Neoliberalism is not uh, doing new violences. It's just exacerbating things that have been there from the outset. In terms of the marriage between the state and, and capital, um, I would say that maybe that was a different relationship before and maybe it's incestual in that sense, because uh, nation states were created to protect property. That's the, the bottom line. Um, how our relationship to property and to the nation state has developed is a different question. But it's not some, this marriage is not something new. And it has always been <coughs> predicated on exploitation, expropriation, and conquest, and colonization somewhere else. Now, how are we going to live from now, <laughs> right? Now that we see that the house is crumbling, what I've been talking about uh, in my work is that, in, always through metaphor, because it's easy, <laughs> uh, we are at, the, at a point of hospicing a system that's dying, that is collapsing. And in this process of hospicing, we're hospicing ourselves within it, because we're part of it. Consciously or unconsciously, we are invested in the house. And we don't know how to live outside of it, because we haven't been exposed to much else, right? So in this process of hospicing, imagine there is this process of hospicing here, and then also the birth. We are assisting with the birth of something different, undefined, potentially wiser, but not necessarily. It can be also horrible. Right? And in the middle of this, there is a storm, and we are right in the eye of that storm. If we walk too fast, we get caught in the storm. If we walk too slow, we get caught in the storm. So what does it mean to hold these two possibilities in place? The system that is dying and something that is struggling to be born, but could be born in a wiser way. What do we have to do in the hospicing process? So thinking about hospicing, it's not glamorous. It's not a glamorous job. It involves a lot of cleaning up, actually. It involves a lot of patience, being present to what it, whatever is dying. It involves not wanting to kill it, necessarily. Although sometimes there is <laughs> part of me. Um, diarrhea, vomiting, right? But it also involves this, this necessity to see that a death is necessary for something to be cleared for the new to be able to survive. Otherwise, we keep on repeating the same mistakes uh, that we have repeated in the past. Well, I want to make new mistakes, not the same mistakes. How do we get to the, a point of wisdom where we understand the mistakes that have been made 
and the gifts that these mistakes have offered us at the same time that we are ready to do something different. So in order to go back to the knowledge part uh, that I said in the beginning I would go back to, in Brazil we have this, I'm Brazilian by the way, uh, born in the middle of two uh, con cultures and conflicts, so my dad is German, my mom uh, is indigenous. So, in, but in Brazil, we have this proverb that says that um, a gente só começa a nadar quando a água bate na bunda, which is translated in more detail as in a situation of flood, um, so when the water is rising and it's at your ankle, you cannot do anything but walk, right? Then you put the boots on, the rubber boots on. Then the water continues to rise and it is at your knee, and then the water gets into the boot. And that's cold, that's not very cool. You have to take the boots off, but it, you can only, only uh, walk. There's no way you can swim. It's only when the water reaches your bum, in Portuguese it's your abs, <laughs> it's only when the water reaches your bum or your hip that it is possible for us to walk, to swim, right? But by this point, we're already very afraid of, of drowning if you don't know how to swim. So what I'm, I think the one way to finish this is that the water is rising, right? And it's not going to be just for others over there. It's going to be for everybody. How do we swim? We don't know because it's not the time yet. <laughs> but we need to pay attention to those who have been swimming before. In many ways, our privilege has, uh, uh, in Portuguese would be fragilizado, I don't know how to, has, has have made us fragile. So everything that we have here that uh, has its hidden cost somewhere else, has made us actually quite fragile, right? Other people who have been fighting it, those who have been uh, subsidizing what we have, actually have lots of things to teach us in terms of how to survive this. And I would say, in order to learn how to swim, we need to start to listen to what has happened before in order to learn from the places of struggle how we can create another, for, another form of existence. Thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you for your amazing words. So in relation to what you said, how do we swim, let's highlight fighters and warriors that have been swimming. So that leads me to resistance and seeking change and closing points. So if we could just go down in any order you please and speak about resistance. Would you like to go first, Lisa? I can go first. Um, so the way the way I think about resistance is that um, we live in moments of acute crisis, and uh, you know, some people ask me, "So what do we do? Do we do we do bandage solutions? You know, you put a bandaid a little bit, but the wound is still deep." <coughs> and you haven't taken care of the root of the problem, you just take care of the surface, or do you do something more radical? And I usually respond to this question saying that because we live in such an acute moment of crisis, uh, we can no longer afford to say, uh, no, this is good, but this is not good the other solution is better. I usually say that do whatever you can. Band-aid solutions and radical solutions. And so I want to refer first to a few band-aid <coughs> solutions and then a few radical solutions. So take your pick what you would like to, to do. And so um, I have, uh, you know, despite all the horrible things that we've been hearing in the news about what's happening in the States recently with the deportation of undocumented immigrants, um, the ban, the Muslim ban, uh, and so on and so forth, I've also have come across uh, so many hopeful you can call them band-aid solutions. 
Uh, but they are very hopeful because, uh, well, they, they, take, they take care of the problem momentarily um, or for the moment. Um, so some of these solutions are, uh, I've been reading about how <coughs> cities are declaring themselves sanctuaries for immigrants. I've been hearing about how university campuses refuse to cooperate with immigration authorities when they come to take students that take, that are, you know, undocumented take classes. Um, I've been hearing about um, people that they go and knock down the door of the neighbor when they get a whiff that ICE, the immigration officers, are coming to deport that neighbor. Um, I've been hearing about divesting from stocks in private prisons and detention centers. I've been hearing about churches that function as sanctuaries. So these are some of the, and, and I'm also, by the way, I've, I've also been hearing about, you know, lawyers uh, volunteering their time to offer legal services to people that are about to be deported and so on and so forth. So these are some of the band-aid solutions. So what are some of the radical solutions now? Because I want to, see more radical action. And I'm just going to read some because um, I just don't want to lose my train of thought. So here are some of the radical solutions. I think Western states should stop bombing, invading countries, depleting the global south from their resources, I think we should start tackling climate change. I think we should end deregulated capitalism. I think we should respect Aboriginal sovereignty and treaties, treaties because I think the number one people that are being dispossessed are Aboriginal people through extractivist projects. That is called settler colonialism. I think we should forgive the debt to the third world. Change how we trade with the third world. Open our borders wide open. I know some of you might think I'm crazy to say that. But we should open our borders and welcome the vulnerable that knock at our door. I think we should end deportations. I think we should end detentions. And I think we should abolish prisons. And my last thing that I want to say is a beautiful quote by an activist. It's just two sentences. She says, Butterflies have always had wings. People have always had legs. The freedom of movement is a human right. Thank you. It's in order. If you want. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs> This is, this is a big question, and I'm not going to pretend to have answers. Um, I do want to say, though, that um, first thing is, I think that um, all of us uh, have a habit of, um, which is an understandable habit, but I don't think we realize just how bad things are. And uh, that's the first step to, uh, or to addressing that is the first step to, 
actually having a resistance movement, if that makes sense. We need to know what our challenges are. So today, um, M103, the anti-Islamophobia bill got passed, which is great. Um, it's a pretty um, roughly sent us, uh, um, uh, empty bill. You know, it's just something like Parliament needs to <coughs> recognize that Islamophobia is a, is real. Uh, the most tangible thing is something along the lines of um, uh, having actual like data on hate crimes and things like that, which is useful, right? That's information we need. Um, so it passed, but it didn't pass overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, which is what you might expect or hope for such a, you know, it was a symbolic gesture in light of uh, the six Muslims who were killed in the mosque in Quebec City, right? For such a symbolic gesture, you would think everyone would be like, oh yeah, of course, and, but let's be against Islamophobia. Who's not against Islamophobia? But it just like, it was like the majority of the conservative MPs voted against it. Uh, and uh, my feeling, my sense is that there's going to be a backlash from Kelly Leach, yeah. uh, the uh, uh, front runner for the leadership of the conservatives, it has played you know, a major role in attacking this uh, bill. And uh, uh, previously, she's supported uh, screening immigrants to Canada uh, for their Canadian values to see you know, how pro-Canadian values they are. Uh, and of course, that's based on racist assumptions about um, people who aren't Canadian being more everything, right? Uh, violent, sexist, whatever else. Uh, she supported the, uh, initiated the barbaric practices tip line, where you call up, call someone, I don't know who, uh, and report people, right? Brown people, black and brown people, on their barbaric practices, apparently. So Kelly Leach is front runner of the conservatives, uh, and there's going to be a backlash uh, for this for this uh, this bill that just passed today, this simplistic or empty bill, um, and I think it'll be part of a broader backlash. Right? There's the backlash is a, kind of a backlash that we've seen uh, in the past. Right? Anytime people previously oppressed people marginalized people made some serious gains. There was always an effort, uh, and it's often been successful, to push back, right? Just when they've gained uh, so much, that's when uh, the biggest backlash comes. So I think something is coming, um, and you know, we see manifestations of it in a lot of, a lot of ways. As I said, Kelly Leach is the front runner, and she's straight up racist. She's just, uh, she's our Trump. Uh, we see the Soldiers of Odin, an anti-immigrant vigilante group patrolling East Vancouver uh, and Montreal and Toronto and everywhere. Uh, we see the KKK flyering in Maple Ridge and Chilliwack. We see anti-Asian flyering in Richmond. You know, there, there are a lot of things happening. And I think sometimes we diminish those things and just focus on this anti-Islamophobia bill passed today. Right? That's all the news we see. We don't, we don't realize that they're doing a lot of work. Um, and this echoes what happened in the United States. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not happy to say that I, I predicted that Trump would win the election because uh, I was very aware of the fact that corporate media is was too obviously in support of Clinton, right? And anytime uh, the media is clearly in support of one party or one candidate rather than others, a lot of times what they're reporting is an, an accurate assessment of what's happening it's a way to convince people that something is inevitable, which isn't, right? So all the while they're saying, oh, this is inevitable, this is inevitable, I kept thinking, oh, okay, whatever they're saying, the opposite is the reality, right? Something's going on, right? So then Trump won, and I mean, it wasn't a total surprise to me. I, I thought, at worst, it could be close, or closer than people expected. So first off, I think things are a lot worse than you realize, right? There's a huge white nationalist, racist backlash emerging, growing, building, uh, and organizing. Um, <clears throat> how we fight that, uh, I'm still unclear. I do know that uh, most of the ways that we previously and continue to do things is flawed. Uh, we have kind of top-down, vanguardist approach to everything. You know, it manifests itself in everything that we do. All our community organizing is led by 
a few prominent middle class activists, and meanwhile everyone just watches them do their thing, right? Um, I think we need to tap into and grow the incredible talent and personal depth and knowledge and information and uh, personal commitment that exists in all our communities, in every single person. You know, I've seen so much incredible spirit and intelligence and commitment from everybody. Every single person has something to contribute to these movements. Um, and we have a habit of focusing far too much on people who can speak a certain way, you know, uh, who can um, create narratives, basically. And there are, there are vastly different ways in which people can, tr can contribute to the movement. And we need to tap into that now uh, before this backlash comes. Thanks. The question of resistance and change is what keeps me awake at night. Because the question forces me to look inwards and exercise my own reflexivity. Basically to question my own privilege. I am part of a professorial managerial class. Certainly privileged in that sense. And I've often asked how and I also encourage you to ask yourselves, how can we use our own privileges for systemic change? There are many groups, organizations, movements that have been doing this questioning and using their own privileges, even the most dire circumstances. And I won't repeat them and what they're doing here, but I want us to think more about how we can capitalize on, our, on different ways of thinking about the world, about people, about resources, about assets. I think the first thing I'd like us to ask is to redefine value. <coughs> what that means and decouple value from profit. To think of intersectional ways of looking at value, not just use value or exchange value or market value, but also spiritual value, ecological value, artistic value. What is important to us? The second big thing I'd like, uh, the, I think the third big thing I'd like us to think about besides questioning and using our own privilege and defining value is how can we move from one exclusionary to inclusionary thinking, two from grievance to redress, and from critique to action. I think now is the time for us to employ and promote critical thinking, number one. Number two, critical media literacy and intersectional feminist social justice thinking. You could tell my bias from my institutional affiliations. <laughs> so I'll begin with critical thinking. I'd like us to connect the dots. And I have a lot of resources here and references, book titles. I won't uh, bother you with that. But I want us to be able to connect the dots between the current culture of narcissism, thought, about by Christopher Lash in the late 60s that gave rise to the individual ethos that, that Jamie earlier explained to us associated with neoliberalism. Connect the dots between the culture of narcissism with the promotion and growth of celebrity culture and the rise of infotainment. Or what Christopher Hedges mentioned in the book Empire of Illusion, the End of Literacy and the Triumph of Spectacle that presage the rise of Trump and the, appre the Apprentice, which went hand in hand with the rise of the culture of fear, which in turn exacerbates xenophobia and worsens social and economic inequality and the level of trust in society. As Brian Glasner puts it, in culture of fear, why Americans are afraid of the wrong things, one of the paradoxes of a culture of fear is that 
serious problems remain largely ignored, even though they give rise to precisely the very dangerous populations of war. Poverty is correlation with crime, drug and child abuse, the larger the gap between the, the, the rich and the poor, the worse off people are in terms of health outcomes and political instability. And hence the important role of mass media, whose growth, including that of mainstream and alternative and underground social media, has blurred all lines between truth and fiction. And as a result, confuse our sense of reality that makes everything seem subjective. This cheapens any notion of death and substance in favor of the image. I like what Vanessa said earlier, now more than ever, we need to go beyond images, away with dead metaphors that do no longer work for transformative change. We need new metaphors to bring us to a new a kind of society that we want away from this transnational sense of dystopia. Now is the time for intersectional feminist social justice thinking because intersectionality offers hope for new forms of solidarity amongst those conf con confronting multiple axes of differences and oppression. And lastly, from <coughs> grievance to redress, from critique to action. What does redress mean when we think, for instance, of decolonization? When decolonization can only proceed if global capital works towards redress with government in order to redress the plunder of native lands slave labor exploitation, and working class dislocation in the current world. So I go back to how we can think about the very dangers the population abhors. Think about everything that we can contribute to that transformation. Thank you. Maybe I'll um, often uh, endorsing uh, the, a lot of the comments you've already heard, uh, say something about um, uh, why we still need to do some of the kind of dismal labor that uh, I've been largely engaged with, which is about uh, kind of staring into the, if you do stare into the belly of a beast, but uh, analyzing, if you like, um, uh, what the beast is up to, which I think has still got to be, as we imagine strategies for resistance, uh, they ought to, our strategies all, all, always ought to be in dialogue with a, with a, a critical analysis of the present structures of power, violence, and oppression of that, which we've heard a lot. Um, and uh, you know, as perhaps the oldest person in this room, uh, I can say that I've, uh, you know, I've been predicting the death of neoliberalism since before most of you were born. <laughs> um, and, if I could just share some of the, uh, uh, the, the consequences of, of that bitter experience. Um, <laughs> one of the things that it uh, has told me, uh, has taught me, um, is that, um, that the way in which we analyze uh, the present kind of power structure is, is yeah, part of what we need to do in terms of a strategy for building uh, resistance. Uh, and the, the, strat the present power structure is constantly evolving and uh, there are new uh, weaknesses and frailties emerging all of the time. Uh, especially, I think, since the, uh, the Wall Street crash of 2008, where, I mean, it can seem, you know, they say it's uh, you know, easy to imagine in, easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of neoliberal capitalism. Uh, I mean, I think that... You know, in some respects, our uh, imaginaries have got to exceed this moment. But we also need a, a, a critical analysis of the, uh, the limits and frailties of this uh, present project, uh, which it seems to me uh, is running pretty much on empty now, which is why we're looking at this uh, period of recoil, reaction, uh, austerity, uh, the application of uh, ever more uh, authoritarian uh, strategies. Um, uh, this is a different kind of moment in neoliberalism to the uh, 
the one when I kind of first came of age politically uh, in the in the beginning of the Reagan and Thatcher era, when we were everybody was being promised a brighter future at that time. Uh, that's a very different uh, imaginary of the dominant project to the one we get now, which is much more about a, a sort of grim belt tightening. Uh, identification of enemies and so on. And so it, there's a strong sense, I think, um, that this, this neoliberal project is exhausting itself. Uh, at the same time, that the challenges for building sustainable resistance movements are uh, you know, clearly significant. Because one of the things that neoliberalism has done is to successfully <coughs> incapacitate uh, uh, alternatives to itself. It's actually undermined the basis for social collectivity and so on. So we, you know, we shouldn't be surprised that we've, we're living in challenging uh, times. But I think at the same time, the openings uh, today are different to the openings that we saw uh, in the past. And it is hopefully possible to build on uh, some of the uh, new kinds of social movements that are currently mobilizing that aren't only about resisting neoliberalism, but provide a basis for a different kind of politics to that, that we had in the past. I think we've heard a number of people say that one thing we know is that the old strategies are not going to work again. We shouldn't be trying to revert to some sort of past golden age that never existed. Uh, but there are lots of new energies and possibilities around there. In the United States alone, you know, we have um, the Black Lives Matter movement, the Fight for 15, a whole series of social and economic uh, movements uh, that are transforming uh, the social movement landscape uh, quite significantly. At the same time, as the dominant uh, neoliberal project is increasingly uh, encountering its own truly systemic uh, limits. And, and again, I say this as somebody who's made that kind of forecast before, but this moment actually does look rather different to me because Donald Trump is not going to be able to bring back to the United States tens of thousands of factory jobs. Uh, there are things that he just simply will not be able to do and as that project unravels the important thing is going to be to identify uh, alternative economic uh, social uh, projects that can be constructed out of what's left. Um, one of the things that I work on uh, is the politics of, uh, of, uh, of uh, anti-welfare efforts. Uh, yeah, there is a new dynamic uh, towards uh, citizens' income, for example, around the world, which is one of the things that has emerged out of the very limits of, of neoliberalism itself, about the way in which neoliberalism produces precarity, uh, is increasingly uh, struggling to produce uh, decent jobs and so forth. Uh, we've now got a new politics of, uh, of citizens' income and basic income bubbling up all around the world. This is not part of the neoliberal schema. Uh, it offers a basis, it's perhaps an intermediate step, but a basis for a different kind of social solidarity to be built. We don't know what will happen next. Uh, experiments in, in Brazil with Bolsa Familia and so on only got so far, but they did indicate um, you could start to move the needle on social inequality and, and, and see the beginnings of new forms of social uh, uh, solidarity. So uh, yeah, while yeah, things look grim uh, in many respects, uh, there's a kind of resurgence of a different kind of set of, of social movements that offer um, a great deal of uh, hope. Uh, plus this more kind of analytically sober reading of the present time that suggests that perhaps this kind of dominant paradigm is actually starting to get exhausted. I mean, I think we are palpably at a moment where, you know, the, the fresh-faced, optimistic face of neoliberalism is kind of, no one's buying that anymore. Ironically, Justin Trudeau may be the last person standing <laughs> who epitomizes that kind of hopeful Blair Clinton kind of moment. And so kind of Canada's got the last one of them. But there are, you know, there are really not many of them left. Uh, their strategies are pretty empty. Uh, and, and the strategies of Trump and Theresa May and so on in Britain are sort of uh, fairly plainly self-destructive and limited. So. Uh, we're possibly getting towards the end game, where I think you know, the alternative 
imaginaries, alternative social movements and social structures are going to be needed as they've not been needed before uh, in my lifetime, anyway. Um, so, I mean, we don't need to be fatalistic, even if we do need a, you know, I think, a kind of sober analysis of the challenges, but there's a lot that's going on, um, on uh, in progressive politics as well. So I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah, I also really struggled with this question, and um, rather than offering solutions, I think I have like questions. Um, as uh, Lisa, Lisa mentioned, um, history repeats itself, and one of my the challenges I've had in the past few years is like as as a writer. Um, I feel like anything I want to write already exists. Everyone is already talking about these issues. Um, there's just so much rhetoric out there. Is it having any real impact? Um, I don't know. Um, but I think as academics, um, a lot of us, were writers, we're storytellers. And I think what we do is we come up, we redefine language, we redefine definitions. And I think what maybe what we could work towards is is um, is is um, as Lenora mentioned, we need new metaphors. So maybe we also need a new language, and we need new definitions. And our so our con like reconceptualizing borders, and also reconceptualizing refugees. If refugees and displacement is something so normal, so common, how do we understand that in a radically new and different way? Um, uh, and also how storytelling can also have um, implications in policy making. The stories that exist in the public psyche, that exist in the public imagination, how they have a very real impact in what policies um, our, our, our societies come up with. Um, uh, I also think there needs to be Along with radical storytelling, there also needs to be radical listening. I think we need to, um, I know it sounds very idealistic, and it probably is, but I, I feel like we also need to, to really um, listen to the stories that don't exist, you know, try harder to listen to stories that don't exist in our immediate bubble. And I think, especially as a student on like this campus, I feel like I'm in much of a bubble, and something I want to do is is burst that bubble, is to go and listen to other voices and stories that, I'm not, uh, that, are, that are not reaching me. Um, and I also think, uh, connecting with storytelling, I also think we need to look at the way, um, look at our education systems, at our curriculums, at pedagogy, what, what are children learning, what stories are, are, are um, being framed, how are they being framed for them, <coughs> even curriculum, like what voices exist in our, in, our, in our curriculums, in our textbooks, um, who are the writers that we're learning from. So that's something I'm thinking about. And yeah, I don't know if, if how practical that is, but that's something. I don't have anything that could contribute more than what's already been said. I, I'm just, I feel pretty lucky to be up here. I'd be just as happy to hear Vanessa close the conversation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I think what came to my mind is that the idea that change, when you imagine change, it's very difficult to imagine something different from what we're used to. So it's like imagining, talking about change and, and imagining a change of clothes, something something more comfortable or trendier or that uh, is easier to, to watch or something like that. But what if change really involves stripping down naked and sleeping in the cold, right? What if that's what it takes? And I think in the long haul, that's what it will take. So we need the stamina to be able to be prepared for radical change uh, that might not be very comfortable uh, for a lot of people. But remember that it hasn't been comfortable for a lot of people already. Um, and in that sense, analysis are extremely important because in, in the stamina that we need to be able to see how the system has 
I'm sorry about the language, but it will come. Fucked us up, right? <laughs> and it, it, if we don't realize that, and if we don't feel that, uh, then we will co continue to want to change the clothes, rather than strip down naked and sleep in the cold. So we need that, but we also need to find, and I'm, I'm drawing on the Tabu King here too, uh, we need to find different sources of joy. We need a different way of being, where we can meet this yearning that we have for wholeness. We have that, and we are looking for it. We are just probably distracted or deluded that we're going to find it in consumption, or in um, status, in prestige, in something, or in knowledge, right? But this wholeness is found, beyond, it's found in our relationships beyond knowledge, beyond identity, beyond understanding. So how do we get to that space of being that can actually fulfill the yearning that we have and take us to a different type of relationship between ourselves, within ourselves, and with the planet itself? Maybe that is what it takes for us to be able to, um, to change this, but that requires a disinvestment, an interruption of the satisfactions that we have with our current investments in the system. And we have to ask ourselves, are we, re are we happy, ready to disinvest in social mobility? Are we happy to disinvest in consumption? Are we happy to disinvest in security or in separability, in understanding ourselves as separate from each other, in losing our um, autonomy, right? Are we really happy to see ourselves in each other and see that any violence committed against the planet or another person is a violence that we commit to ourselves? So that's the kind of change that we're talking about. And I think palliative change, like changing in terms of pushing government and protecting the vulnerable, this is all very, very, very important. But we also need to be attentive to the other level of change uh, that we need, which is not just a change of tune in a radio, it's a change of band, change of wavelength of how we exist with each other in one planet, one finite planet. I'd like just to, to uh, acknowledge that the, the metaphor of the house was used in an article collectively written with students, and uh, the first author was here. I can't see her anymore, but it's Sharon Stein. She probably went, and she knew that I was going to do this, <laughs> and she would be read, so she probably went. But um, now, <laughs> if you Google probably the house the modernity built uh, on, on Google, you will find where uh, the article is, it was published last week. Uh, and there we, we elaborate a little bit more about the housing in relation to Trump and in relation to the American dream. And she, uh, Sharon, did a brilliant analysis of uh, seeing the American dream as uh, either a broken promise or a, a promise that was unrealistic and violent and exploitative from the outset. Having said that, uh, I'm really involved with the, the, a movement called Buen Vivir which is an Andean movement that makes a distinction between um, living well and living better, saying that the living better, which is the current paradigm of amending growth and consumption, is unsustainable, irresponsible, and violent, whereas living well is, um, is about uh, understanding ourselves very differently, relating very differently to the planet, and it doesn't uh, need, require this accumulation of junk basically, that uh, we have been used to, to doing. So I think they are some of the swimmers, but there are other swimmers out there um, that we can, we can look at as well. Uh, also look at working with transition town um, movement uh, groups, or working with degrowth um, people. Permaculture people are also very interesting to engage with. Um, and all these movements are trying to do something different but still from the hot ashes of the old that haven't cooled yet. So it's important to engage with these alternatives with, with critical eyes open and with, with your heart open as well. Understanding that there are gifts, but there are lots of contradictions, paradoxes, and limitations in all of this movement. So for me, we also need a different way, an alternative way to engage with alternatives. And in that sense, the work of Bovenzo de Souza Santos in terms of um, working with an ecology of knowledge is understanding that every knowledge is also an ignorance is extremely useful in that sense. Because at the university, we, we're not used to engaging with multiplicity of knowledges. We're used to engaging with uh, depth of single paradigms. And, and there's, there's a gift in there as well. But when this paradigm is perceived to be universal and uh, other alternatives are not um, 
presented in a symmetrical way or, or uh, not engaged with in this, at the same level, then it becomes a problem. Then it creates the walls in our minds. And I think we, we do need to uh, look for the swimmers, uh, look for the knowledges that have been um, subalternized or made invisible in, the con in this context that we live because we are actually fragile and we are in debt with them. Right? So thinking about them coming here is one way of thinking about it. Thinking about us going there now asking for help uh, because we will need it uh, is another. And I would prefer the second one because it, it puts us in a position of vulnerability that is actually our strength in creating another way of being. Off, I'd like to say thank you so much for speaking to topics uh, that are extremely close to a lot of our hearts. So that means a lot. And to end off, I'd like to point out how these talks we have, terms and stats we talk about, we also need to realize that they're not solely things you find in textbooks, but real lived lives, as we were told on this panel. Um, so from this panel, I think we should, one of the things we should take is to keep in our minds, hearts, and souls People in detention centers, refugee camps, private and corporate prisons, folks lost at sea in front of lines standing in opposition to police officers, and to those who, whose existence is a form of survival and a form of resistance. Um, so thank you again. And I know we had a question A, question A kind of session, but we are a little bit over time. I don't know if panelists are OK with staying a little bit longer, or if they want to individually speak to you. But yeah, I'll say we'll end it off here for folks who want to leave, and then folks who want to stay behind, feel free to approach and uh, talk to these folks. Thank you for coming.